Hello, and welcome to this series on the characteristics of a biblical church. Over the last year, I've received numerous emails from people asking me, how do I find a biblical church? What does a biblical church look like? How do I know if I'm in a church that God wants me to be in? There's all of these different denominations out there. There's all of these different churches out there. What does a biblical church look like? How do I know it when I will see it? That's what's really prompted me to put this short series together. Now let me say in the beginning that this is, my, my purpose here is not to give a detailed complete study on what the church is. That would be far beyond the scope of what I'm going to be doing here. But the purpose in, my, in, in this series is to give a biblical description of what a church is. One, I'm going to give you first the definition. What does the word church mean? When the Bible talks about church, when the Bible talks about it, what is the church talking about? Then we're going to look at the basic purpose of the church. Very simple now, basic purpose of the church. And then I'm going to give you 19 characteristics of a biblical church. When the scriptures talk about church, what does it mean? And what should it look like? Let's jump right in here now. First, let's look at what does the word church mean. Now, I'm talking about what the Bible says, not what the world says, not what people say. What does the word of God mean when it talks about and mentions the word church? The word church comes from the Greek word ekklesia, and it literally means whether spiritually or whether secularly, it actually refers to an assembly of people. Any group of people that are gathered together, that have pulled themselves out from society or whatever, and are meeting together for whatever reason, <clears throat> that's the word ecclesia. Now, when you look at it from a spiritual perspective and how it's used oftentimes in Scripture, that spiritual identity has been added to that and it's meant it's come to mean more a group of people that have been called out from the world and belong to God a group of people that have been called out from the world and belong to God they have gathered together they are an assembly of believers that believe in God and are meeting together that's the scriptural meaning and the spiritual meaning of ecclesia. So when you talk about church in scripture, it is always talking about people. It's not talking about a building, and it's not talking about a denomination. It's, not, it's talking about always people, either individually or people in a group. It's always people. It's not now. Now we get into it sometimes. You know, we're riding down the road and we see this building over here with a steeple on it. We go, "Oh, there's a church, and there's a church. Oh, look at that church there." Okay. I mean, we know what we mean by that, and we know what we're saying. But that's not what the Bible is talking about. It's not talking about the building. It's talking about the people. In the early days, I mean, believers they met in different homes. They would go to this person's house or this person's home where they'd meet over here or they'd meet outside underneath a tree or whatever. They were still the church. Even though they didn't have a specifically designed building, they were still the church. Now in scripture, the word church is used in two distinct categories. Let me call them categories. One, the Bible refers to the universal church. And then secondly, it refers to the local church, universal church and the local church. First, the universal church. The universal church is made up of all Bible-believing, born-again Christians. Every single person who has trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and has been born again by the Spirit of God and they've been baptized by the Holy Spirit. I'm not specifically talking about water baptism here, although that is a command and true believers should be baptized in water, but they've been baptized into the body of Christ, which I'll explain in a moment, 
and they have been born again. They are part of the universal church. Every single person on the entire planet who has ever trusted in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, been born again by the Spirit of God, they are members or part of the universal church. Listen to just a few verses where scripture is referring to the universal church. Ma uh, Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now notice he said here, I will build my church, singular. He didn't say I will build my churches or I will build many churches. He says, I will build my church. He's referring to the universal church, every single believer that is trusted in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 9. For I am the least of the apostles, Apostle Paul speaking here. He says, for I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Notice again, he uses it in a singular form. He was out there and he was persecuting all the Christians he could. He was going to all the different local locations and persecuting whatever Christian he could find. As many as he could find, but he refers to it as the church singular of God. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. See, singular, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So notice you've got, again, you've got all the different people in different locations and this and that, but the church here is referred to in a singular word, the word church. That's the universal church. No matter where you are, no matter what location you were in, no matter what local body you were a part of, if you truly trusted Christ, you are part of the universal church of God. Now we move to the second, the local church. The local church is a group of believers, a group of believers who are members of the universal church, but they now regularly meet together in a specific location. Okay, now this is where you're getting into, here's a church here, and here's a church here, and here's a church over here, and here's a church over there. All made up of born-again believers, but now they're meeting individually or in different groups in different localities. That's the local church. Here's some examples. Acts 11.22. Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. See, a specific location. Here's a church, a group of believers in Jerusalem. Acts 13.1. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. So you've got a church in Jerusalem. You've got a church, a group of believers here in Antioch. 1 Corinthians 1.2. To the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So see, you are a group of born-again believers who have trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, which makes you part of the universal church. But now some of the members in that universal church are meeting in a local church in a local location. And here they were at Corinth. One more. Galatians 1, verses 1 through 3. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me, to the churches, see the plural, to the churches of Galatia, Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Note he uses plural here. Now you've got one town, one location, Galatia, but in there, there were numerous local churches. Now, in order to be a member of a true biblical local church, you must be part of the universal church. That's first. Everyone is automatically, if you're a true born-again Christian, 
you've trusted in Christ as your Savior, you're automatically part of the universal church. And then when you break that down into different locations, you have the local church. See the distinction there? But my, my point here is now, if we just look at churches that exist right now, are there people in that local church uh, that are not born-again believers? Absolutely. Absolutely. I would say in most, if not all, you could probably have some smaller, smaller congregations where everyone is truly saved. But in a lot of churches, especially when you're talking 50, 60, 70, 100, 200, certainly when you get above that, you've got people there that are not truly born again. Now, on a, on a human level, from man's perspective, they may be part of that local congregation. But biblically, scripturally, from God's perspective, they are not true members of the local church. Because in order to be true members of a local church, to be biblical members of a, of a local church, you've got to be part of the universal church. You have to be truly born again. So do you have a mixture? Yes, because God talks about the wheat and the tares that are in a local congregation. But what I'm giving you is the biblical definition of, a uni of the universal church and of the local church. The biblical de definition and description of what they are. Hopefully that's clear. If not, email me. I'll try to make it clear. All right? So let's jump right in now and start looking at what are the characteristics, the biblical characteristics of a true Bible-believing, born-again biblical church. That's what we're going after here. Here's what they should look like. Here's what they should be doing. Here should be the characteristics. Here is what, if you're looking for a, the true church of God, if you're looking for that, these are the characteristics that you should be looking for. And again, let me put a little side note here. I will probably refer a number of times to the church of God or the church of Jesus Christ when I say that, I'm talking about it from a biblical perspective. That when I say church of God, that this is the church that God is building. This is the church that is truly a biblical church. I'm not talking about a denomination. Because there are certain denominations or organization, organizations, I could call it, that call themselves the church of God. Or the church of Jesus Christ. The Mormons do that. They call themselves the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm not referring to that. I'm referring to this totally on a biblical, scriptural basis. Okay? Number one of the 19 characteristics of a biblical church. If I stay on track, we should do this in five parts. It should be a five-part series. Number one, the church's foundation is Jesus Christ. What is a biblical church? The church's foundation is Jesus Christ. It must be built upon Jesus Christ. To be a true biblical church, it is not built upon a, an individual, a particular person, a particular man. Uh, some examples, and again, I'm not trying to say that, that I don't want to go too far with this or go overboard with it, but uh, people get involved, and when they start following the teachings of man, uh, you have to be very, very careful. As long as those teachings are in line with the Word of God, uh, I'm of the perspective, don't get man involved at all. You know, don't just don't start labeling yourself as following a certain man. Stick to the scriptures. Some examples would be uh, your Lutheran churches. A lot of them are following the teachings of Martin Luther. Now, as long as Luther is lining up with the scriptures, fine. But again, when you start mixing, you've got to be careful. So the true biblical church is not founded upon Martin Luther. It's not founded on the, uh, the Wesley brothers. Uh, you get from the Wesley brothers, the Methodists. They started following them and taking some of their teachings, and many of their teachings were scriptural, but they kind of make that part of the foundation. It's not, you got the Lutherans, you got the Methodists. There's those that follow the teachings of Menno Simmons. You get your Mennonite church from that. You've got to be careful. You've got to be very careful because uh, I've seen in a number of the Mennonite churches, you've got all different kinds of Mennonite churches, but many times they can become more interested in what did Menno say. What did he feel? What did he think? Uh, you want to study history and see what somebody thought? Fine, but if that's what you're going to be basing your beliefs on, you see, you're mixing it with a man. 
then the foundation is not Jesus Christ and Christ alone. The true biblical church is founded upon Jesus Christ and Christ alone. The Mormons do it with Joseph Smith. They mix him in and they're following him. We can look at some of the pastors today. We have to be very careful. And with some of these names I'm going to give you, I'm not saying that these people claim to be the foundation of the church. I'm not saying that. But you can see where with some of these, the people actually start following the man more than they follow what the Word of God says. Uh, a Copeland would be an example. Uh, a Joel Osteen. A lot of times people are just they're looking at what Joel Osteen says. Or they're looking at what Kenneth Copeland says. Or what does uh, Joyce Meyer say? And, and I'm not, again, I'm not saying that they claim to be the foundation of the church. Because I've never heard them do that. But if you're not careful, you start becoming disciples of those people. Maybe that's the best way to put it. More on what I would call the positive side, uh, a John MacArthur. Um, I love the teachings of John MacArthur. So I'm not, I'm not saying, uh, you know, John MacArthur's doing the wrong thing. But boy, if you're not careful, you can start to become a disciple of John MacArthur. What does John MacArthur say? And well, John MacArthur doesn't believe this or he doesn't say that. So that you got to be careful. Uh, Charles Stanley. Uh, all of these things, you've got, to be, you've got to be careful. Again, I know I'm saying it 12 times. I'm not condemning those people. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just saying you don't want to be a disciple of Charles Stanley or John MacArthur or Joel Osteen or T.D. Jakes or anything like that. You don't want to be caught up in following a person. You want the foundation of that church to be Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. The foundation cannot be a particular denomination. A lot of people are call, caught up in that. They go to a particular church because it's Reformed. Or because, as we said, it's Lutheran. Or it's Baptist. Uh, why you go to this church? Well, I'm a Baptist and this church is a Baptist. That's not the foundation. That's not the foundation. Now, a lot of these exist because they have their own particular doctrines that they hold on to. But if you're not careful... You're following the teachings of a denomination and not following the Word of God. It's got to be the Word of God. Now, I'm saying all these people aren't following the Word of God. I'm not saying that, but you start mixing things. And now you've got to start looking, well, what's truly the Word of God and what's our own... You know, you get into some of the Baptist churches, there's like 27, 28, 29 different Baptist churches. Well, if they're all following the Word of God, how could you have so many different Baptist churches? You understand what I'm saying? Uh, you've got Roman Catholics. You've got Episcopalian. Uh, we're breaking off from here. Or we're breaking off from Catholicism. And we're breaking off from this. You've got the Methodists. You've got the Pentecostals. You've got the Charismatics. What do you got? You've got the Presbyterians. you got... What? You know, why are all of these different de denominations there? That's a whole study in itself. Point is, you want to be in the church that says we are following the scriptures. That is our foundation. The scriptures and the scriptures alone. That is our foundation. A lot of them say it, but they're not. And we're not mixing it with the teachings of man. And we're not mixing it with a particular denomination. And thirdly, let me move on with this. Let me, uh, the, the foundation, again, is Jesus Christ. It's not the congregation. The church does not belong to the congregation. The congregation does not own the church. The people do not own the church. The pastor doesn't own the church. Depending on certain, uh, there's churches that are called congregational churches. We run the church. Okay, is that scriptural? Is that what Jesus taught? That the congregation runs the church. There's a number of independent churches out there where the pastor started the church. And all of a sudden, not always, but a lot of times when the pastor starts the church, it becomes his church. This is Pastor Bob's church, and this is Pastor George's church, and this is Pastor uh, Bill's church. And this is, you've got to be very careful with that. Very careful. And a lot of times, you know, things can go on and things are wrong. They, well, there's the pastor and he started it and this and that. Or, Congregations get in. Congregations can go both ways. Congregations can look at, well, we just hire the pastor. We hire him. We fire him. I know a lot of elders and deacons that think that way. You're just an employee of the church. Wrong. Not scriptural. Not biblical. Don't want to go too far. Or there's some go the other way, and they just totally throw themselves at the feet of the pastor and say, well, the pastor thinks this, and the pastor says that, and the pastor does that. Well, who gives two zippity doo dots? What does the Word of God say? What does Jesus say? 
It is the responsibility of the congregation to line up with what Jesus says. It is the responsibility of the pastors and the elders and the deacons to line up with what Jesus says. Why? Because the church belongs to Jesus Christ. I don't care if your great-grandfather put the first brick out in the corner of the building and you've been there for 200 years. The church doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I will build my church. And that's the only church that Jesus is building, the one that belongs to him. The church is built upon Jesus Christ. Let's give you some scripture now, okay? Because I'm only on number one. I got to move along. 1 Corinthians 3.11. This says it right here. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Boom. End of story. That's it. It doesn't get any plainer than that. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is the foundation. Ephesians 2, 18 through 22. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. That's Jesus Christ. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now the foundation of the prophets is the word of God, what they've been teaching. Ephesians 2, 22 through 23. And he put all things under his feet, Jesus, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Colossians 1.18, and he is the head of the body. The body of Christ is the universal church. Every single born-again believer. That's a whole series in itself of how the church is the body of Christ. But for this, that's what we're focused on here. And Jesus Christ is the head. He's the one in charge. He's the one that makes the rules. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in him, all things, he may have the preeminence. The church belongs to Jesus Christ, not to man, not to the pastor, not to the congregation, not to a particular denomination. And because it belongs to Jesus Christ, everything should be done his way. He knows he's the one, not man's way. He needs to be the foundation. Without Jesus Christ as the foundation of the church, you only have a gathering of people. You do not have a biblical church. Let me move on. Number two. And I'm going to hit this one quick because we've really talked about it already. Two. The congregation needs to be made up of born-again believers. Those that have truly, personally trusted and received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. These are the individuals that have repented of their sins, that have trusted and received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They've been spiritually born again, as God says that we need to be, and they've been baptized with the Holy Spirit, making them members of the body of Christ. Let me just give you a few verses. John chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's just that simple. Being born again is not a denomination that's been made up. God says you must be spiritually born again. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? He's looking at it physically. Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. He's talking about a spiritual rebirth. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. That's what God is saying. You have to be born. You have to be spiritually born again to be, become a part of the body of Christ, to be part of the universal church. It's not just anybody in the world gathering together. Acts 2, 38 through 41. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
There it is. You got your third, three things right there. Repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you go back there and read in, in, in Acts 2, everything that's taking place here, Peter is preaching to the crowd there, and he says, This Jesus, whom you have crucified, the one that you just put on the cross, God has raised him from the dead and set him down on his right hand. He is, in essence, he is the Messiah. He was the one sent here from God, and you took him and you crucified him. You killed him. In verse 38 of Acts chapter 2, then Peter said to them, let me back up one verse. Now when they heard this, they were cut to their heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it says those that gladly received that message, they repented of their sins, they confessed Jesus Christ as their Savior, they received Him as their Savior, they were spiritually born again, baptized in the body of Christ, became part of the universal church. The scripture goes on to say, and that day God added 3,000 people to the church. But you see the conditions that are there? You have, to be, you have to be born again like that. It's made up of born again believers. And that spiritual baptism becoming part of the body of Christ, it happens at the moment of salvation. The moment that you trust in Christ as your Savior. Listen to the difference here in the, in the two baptisms. Mark chapter 1 verse 8, John the Baptist speaking here. He says, I indeed baptize you with water, but he, referring to Jesus, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit comes and brings us into that one body of Christ, the universal church. Acts 1, verses 4 through 5. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And the scripture goes on to say that they were added to the church. Again, I just said it. 3,000 people became part of the universal church. The universal church, the local church, is made up of, of born-again Christians that have trusted Christ as their Savior. It is not enough. It is not enough to just simply meet with other people in a, in a local congregation. It is not enough to just get together with people and say, uh, yeah, we believe in Jesus, or yeah, we, we believe that Jesus was an actual person, or whatever it might be, or have their own different religious affiliations or different thoughts or, or whatever, or to just get together in the name of God or the name of Jesus that, yes, we're going to worship and praise the Lord. It is not, they must have truly trusted Christ as their Lord and Savior in order to be part of the true church and in order to be part of a true biblical church. If you're getting together with people that have not done that, regardless of whatever definitions and everything else that they have, regardless of what they are doing, you have little more than a social gathering. You're just gathering together with other religious people who are going through their religious motions, having their own religious ceremony, having their own individual beliefs based on whatever those beliefs might be. And as sincere as they might be, I'm not talking about insincerity here, they are not part of the true biblical church if they have not trusted in Christ as their Savior. Jesus said, you must be born again. So we've looked at two characteristics there. Uh, one, Jesus Christ must be the foundation. So when you're looking for a church, you want to be looking for a church where the church is built upon Christ. Not upon man, not upon a denomination, not upon uh, people, not upon any kind of tradition. It's built upon Jesus Christ. 
And secondly, it is made up of people who have truly trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. All right, we're going to move on in our next lesson, pick up with number three in our study on the characteristics of a Bible-believing church. Thank you for watching.